Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Bitcoin gives back. Just gives everything back, doesn't it? Makes a nice little pump to the upside to only just bring it back. Well, this is the problem that we've got, ladies and gentlemen. When you see a move like what we saw yesterday, the idea of taking some money off the table, mainly for the day traders who are compelled to try and hold on to a profitable trade with the prospect of it continuing in their favor, well, they kind of get tested every single time. This tells you that they're in that mood to sell Bitcoin. So any move up is going to grant someone stepping in, quickly selling, and then taking the profit and running. Trapping the retail trader in belief. Yes, Bitcoin's going up. We're going up, ladies and gentlemen. It's broken this price point. It's broken that price point. Ugh. There's too much happening in and around the U.S. economy, which let's just face it, ladies and gentlemen, the U.S. economy is the world's economy, if we're quite honest. Everything you buy is in dollars, whether it's coffee, oil, wheat, grain, gold, silver, palladium, aluminum. Nah, sorry, it's aluminium. Bitcoin, they're all doing it with dollars. The bigger picture of the dollar is suggesting that we might be going into a little bit of a tricky scenario, courtesy of Arthur Hayes. Now, we know who Arthur Hayes is. He is the BitMEX CEO. Bit, hold on, let me get that right. Was that BitMEX or Bit? Yeah, BitMEX co-founder, right? He's coming out talking about the idea of a crypto fire sale is on its way. We've got the halving event and we've also got the Fed that could be pulling out some new tricks. Because let's face it, the Fed wants an excuse to pump money into the economy. As much as they say they don't, when they get that printer running, it's happy days. The potential for a trillion dollars to get put back into the economy. Where are they getting this money from? It just baffles me. But no banks are experiencing any stress tests just yet. We do have earnings season starting, and that's going to really identify where we are with regards to the actual interest rates and inflation. But more importantly, when is the Fed going to cut these interest rates? Why do we need to know about this? Well, it's pretty simple, ladies and gentlemen. We know that Bitcoin is subject to Wall Street behavior. A surprise $200 million outflow on the ETF. And in the article, it said... That even though Bitcoin pumped, surprisingly, it came back down and the ETFs saw an experience of 200 million outflow. Why is it a surprise? It just goes to show that the way people are seeing behavior in Bitcoin, it's just they're not really reading into it properly. There is this dismissal on the bids and the offers. One thing has to happen in order for another to occur. You can't sell if no one is buying. and You can't buy if no one is selling. And in today's live stream, we're just going to go through a couple of instances to help you understand that when you see assets make a move to the upside, it's consistent with them selling. Passive sellers allowing the aggressive buyers to come in and take up whatever orders are available for them to take. Remember, there will always be a supply. We will never run out of a supply. The only reason why price turns at specific points is because you have an exhaustion or a certain amount of people all trying to get into a door that cannot be opened. In the end, what they're going to do they're simply just going to change their direction and go in the opposite way. This is the mechanics of the marketplace. And this is what we're going to talk about in today's live stream. To understand why did Bitcoin come down? Everyone was pumped yesterday. You went on to X. Everyone drew out their pennants, their, their triangles and what have you. And they said, that's it. Breakout confirmed. Then we come back down again, which is a little bit of a pain in the ass. But hopefully with the relationship and understanding of the bids and the offers, you're going to be able to walk away from this live stream understanding what a stop run is. Okay, so hopefully that will serve you throughout the rest of the day and going into the rest of the week. If you are new here and you never come back here again, I know that you'll leave this live with a good understanding about the relationship of the bids and the asks. Now. We are at the eve, ladies and gentlemen, the CPI data. 
that dreaded bout of data is going to be released tomorrow. So really, we only have today to really see the market make an assumed move either to the upside or to the downside in preparation for that information. Tomorrow will be volatile. There is no two ways about it. You're either going to try and take a marginal position right now or you prepare yourself and get ready for tomorrow's data where the volatility will be thrive and you'll be able to step in and clean up with an understanding of what to expect. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you are new to the channel, <laughs> be sure to like and subscribe. Make sure you hit the notification bell as we will be going live again later on this evening. Glasses have been cleaned by my butler, Sam. Sam, thank you very much for that. And all problems are to be blamed on Sam. We don't need to blame Mike Dutch anymore. No, because nine times out of 10, it's human error. And that error is mine. And Mike's just the guy who says, did you do this? Mm, no, it's my fault. So yeah, <laughs> blame Sam now because he just blame Sam, man. Just blame Sam for everything. Anyways, let's get with the flavor, ladies and gentlemen. Here we go. <clears throat> so this is what we're talking about. Um, sack trades. What's happening, bro? Sack trades. The OGs are coming into the live, man. The OGs back in the day. What's good, sack trades, man? RTB, thank you so much for those um, gifted memberships, man. Mad love to you, man. Sack trades. What's happening, bro? Been a while, man. So, <clears throat> what's Arthur saying? This guy's always going to come out with some negativity about BTC or crypto overall. He talks about that this crypto fire sale is due to happen towards the second half of April. He's saying that the Bitcoin halving is going to lead to that. And of course, the Fed's bag of tricks. Now, we go into the article, it says, he says that, April's Bitcoin halving combined with the bag of tricks from the United States Federal Reserve Department will add propellant to a raging fire sale of crypto assets and depress the crypto market for weeks. He does believe that the market will pump in the medium term, but warns that crypto prices directly before and after could be negative. The narrative of halving being positive for crypto prices is well entrenched. When most market participants agree on a certain outcome, the opposite usually occurs, he wrote. That's exactly what happened with the ETF. Everyone was like, it's not going to be a sell the news event. It's not going to be a sell the news event. It ends up becoming a sell the news event. OK, if everyone's expecting the big pump to happen on Bitcoin in the halving event, you can probably more than expect that it's not going to happen. That's what Arthur says. OK, well, what is Arthur? Just because he's a co-founder of an exchange, we could assume that he has a little bit of information about what orders are coming in. I'd say he knows more than what we know, but it all depends because at the end of the day, we will never know what human nature will do. And it's always going to be the case of hindsight. When it actually happens, we'll look back at this and say, hmm, maybe Arthur was right. Hayes was right. OK, Goes on to say that he believes that the halving is also coming at a time when dollar liquidity is tighter than usual and outlined his theory on how the US Federal Reserve and Treasury policies impact the markets. That's why I believe Bitcoin and crypto prices in general will slump around the halving. It will add a propellant to a raging fire cell. So he goes, he even goes on to say a couple of other things. Could the market defy his bearish inclinations and continue higher? Of course, you know, this we can't really say that. But he is long nonstop on crypto. I would be long on crypto if I ran an exchange in cryptocurrency. Like, let's just get it, to, you know. You're not going to be saying to people, no, don't come to cryptocurrency. Don't, don't. Please use my exchange to buy your crypto that I'm telling you not to. Doesn't make sense now, does it? So this is, this is the problem that we've got. You know, it's he's got some readings here about the crypto fear greed index is currently sat at the 80, 90 mark. And he says here that he's decided to stay away from trading until May. All right. Which it's in line with what the Fed's going to try and do after May the 1st, the following the Fed's meeting on the same day. He expects it to reduce the pace of money supply tightening and the Treasury will release from the TGA most likely an additional one trillion dollars of liquidity into the system, which will pump the markets. Can you believe that, ladies and gentlemen? The U.S. debt is increasing by a trillion dollars every hundred days. All right. May 1st, after the Fed's meeting, 
What do you think they're going to probably decide on? Maybe a little bit of a cash infusion in the markets. Awesome. How's that going to help the situation? It's Band-Aid. That's all it is. It's not going to do anything, but the markets will react. So why on earth are we seeing this? Why are they actually getting rid of these ETFs? Well, like I said to you, it's Wall Street, man. Funnily enough, it takes us to the idea, right, that this move to the upside that we saw on Bitcoin yesterday was solidifying everyone's brain that everything's going to go up, okay? But when you expect something to go up, you need to see it do something first to solidify the idea of it continuing, okay? You've always got to put that in your mind. Don't focus on what you want it to do. Focus on what you can see it doing to justify why you, it will end up doing what you think it will do. You're dealing with probabilities, you know? If I decide to go to the gym after this live stream, I will go to the gym with the best intentions of walking to the front door of the gym. If I see a really nice woman walking out of the gym, I'm probably not going to go into the gym. Probability says that I've got a better chance of trying to speak to this girl than try and find another girl who's in there only focusing on doing her own thing in the gym. Her attention's been taken away from the gym. Cool, so she can put her attention on me. That's it. That, I'm, I'm not saying that I go to. No, I'm just giving you an analogy again. These, these. That's the best way to just these real life instances that people experience. Maybe not me, but like just I'm just being helping you understand, you know, value area high, orange juice, champagne. And someone had to come around and say that, what if there are women that have champagne and orange juice mixed together? Well, my friend, that would be the value area in the middle, all right? She'd just be in the middle. She, she's just that kind of girl, you know? <laughs> but anyways, this is what really came into play with this article right here. Um, let me show you. It was when... Surprise, here it is, here we go. And this is going to help us go into the charts and help you understand the bids and the ask, right? Surprisingly, even though Bitcoin pumped up yesterday, the ETF flows were significantly negative. You walk into an auction house. You notice what's being listed in terms of the lots. So you have a house, and you've got a car. And what have they got? Asking price or the start bidding price. 50K for the house, 20K for the car, right? You sat down in the auction and he starts. Lot number 641, bid starting at 50,000. Any bids, any bids, any bids. What's he looking for? He's looking for buyers. Any bids? Oh, put the arm up. Okay, 55,000, 55,000 coming in, going in once, go, oh, 58,000, and he's going in, and he's going in, he's going in. Like right, 60,000, okay, we've got the gentleman over here with the big fat nose. Okay, 72,000 for him. Oh, we got guy in Japan. Okay, cool, he's calling it for 100K. So we've got buyers, 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 buyers. They are offering. Offering out. They're saying, look, I'm happy to buy it. 50K, 70K. They're happy to buy it at whatever price it's going to. But the person who owns the house has the sole goal of selling it to or at a price that is higher than what he had originally bought it for. So when we look back at this transaction right here or this conversation where it says surprisingly, even though Bitcoin pumped up yesterday, why is it surprised? Why are you surprised that the outflows of the ETF were negative when Bitcoin pumped up? Why would you be surprised? Because that's the best time to sell it. You don't sell it when it's dropping. You sell it when it's rising. Do we, do we not do that? This leads me into the conversation about the bids and the offers. The best way to explain the bids and the offers, okay, here are your bids. This is the one side, okay? And here are the offers on the other, right? You've got people that are sat as passive buyers. They've got limit orders in the book, okay? And then you've got offers. These people that are prepared to sell as limit sales. Now, what we don't know is who's buying and who's selling. We don't know how much of are they selling, 
We don't know how much of they are buying. We could see an order right here that gets filled for 350 bids on the S&P. We don't know if that's a new bid. We don't know if that is part of a bigger bid where he's got to load off 2,000 contracts and he needs to get his contracts into the bids. He has to offload that and he puts it into the bids 300, 300 lots at a time, at a time, okay? We don't know that. What we know is at that point in time when the market bids out with 300 contracts, it's a point of interest because it's usually a little bit more than what we normally see. So that could then lead us to believe that it could be a big participant. Likewise, when we see offers to the top side, when you see a big fat offer inside of an order in the S&P coming in about five, 600, you're thinking, whoa, who on earth is selling that much? Well, they're only selling into the people that are aggressively picking up those buy orders. OK, the buy orders get pushed. The aggressive buy orders get pushed into the limit of the limit orders that are sat in the book. The best way to show you that in real time would be like this. What's this, ladies and gentlemen? This is your book map. Look at all these bids right here. You see all these bids that are coming down. These were orders that were placed and cancelled and maybe even filled in the order book. Down here, you can see that someone has now got a bid on Bitcoin at around the 70,595 zone, okay? So someone is passively waiting to buy Bitcoin at that price point. Right now, you can see people are trying to sell their Bitcoin. Look up there, you've got 70,920. You've got someone trying to sell 411 Bitcoin, okay? So someone is waiting to sell at that point. The idea is that we've got to try and see if we can pick up on specific behaviors of the bids and the asks over a period of time so that we can work out how likely price is going to go from one point to the next. The shorter the relationship of the bids and the asks that you are seeking, the harder in principle it's going to be for you to navigate the direction. But when you build a bigger picture of it, it's easier for you to determine how likely they are going to move from one point to the next. So let's just go and have a look at this. So this, just so that we're all on the same page, ladies and gentlemen, these are in principle the guys who buy when price drops. These are the guys who are selling when price rises because you're only going to sell an investment higher. You're not selling it as it drops. That's what retail traders do because they lose their brains and they think, oh, my God. Right. Go into the coin act to put this into perspective. Face value, ladies and gentlemen, looking at this visible range right now. How many of you are of the assumption, whether you are new or old to this channel, how many of you believe that we are in a buyer's market right now? Based on Bitcoin's move from the move to the downside from yesterday, going through to this big high up here, where, what do you think we are in? Are we in a buyer's market or are we in a seller's market? Looking at this range right now, type one for a buyer's market, type two for a seller's market. I want to see what your comments are while I go through um, this whole thing. You've been following Tino's fitness regime for years. <laughs> okay, buyer's market one, seller's market two. Buyer's market one, seller's market two. A lot of you are saying two. Mitch, you're just being special by saying one. I see that. Two, 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 two. Okay. So look, we are in agreement that the majority is saying that we are in a seller's market. That is evident. Why are we in a seller's market? Because price is going up. Look at this big, fat, red carpet of offers. Okay. So let's just go back into the chart of Bitcoin. Let's go back to this. In the offers. There was a ton, right? Let's just clear this up to make it easier for you. There were lots and lots and lots and lots of orders, offers that were just sat in the chart, just all over the place, right? That were all in this area, offers waiting to be filled. And price progressively made its way and ate all of that liquidity. 
because people were aggressively buying yesterday on the back of Bitcoin making the move to the upside. They need a reason to buy. You're not clicking this button right here for no reason. You're going to want to put sense to it. You're going to put technical analysis. You're then going to come to the charts. You're going to say, okay, a pennant flag, a bullish flag, a Fibonacci, your ICTs, your, small, your fair value gaps, whatever it is that you are incorporating into the chart. There is a, there is a reading. There is a, a physical move that is created by a number of behaviors. And those behaviors are based on the bids and the asks. When you see more of the bids appearing at the lows, which we have seen. Look. Look at this area here. Someone came in and planted an order for 1.13 million. He stood there. He was like, you know, I'm Mr. Big Dick. Now I've got myself an order for Bitcoin to buy at 66,100. Another 18.1 million came on top of this guy. Whoa, what's going on? That is a trigger. When the bids come in so aggressively, we would understand it to be the rise, the retrace, the continuation. Yeah. But we also now add context to that. We've seen that there's 18 million transacted at that point. And even if you were to pull up exo charts, all right, and have a look at those price points. We'll go back to that point. What price point was that? Let's just go and have a look. That was the 66, that run 66,000, okay? So just look at this, right? The 66,000 would put us, just wanna make a point about this. Wait there. 66,000, that'll put us right here, ladies and gentlemen, this inside of this range. Look at this. Okay. Look at what's going on here. Do you remember yesterday what I said to you all about the timing of the candlestick? Roughly lasts around five to seven minutes. It takes to create a candle to the sum of 6,765 ticks. For price to transact 6,700 times, okay? Takes around five to eight minutes in this same area where these dudes over here came in, right? Those candlesticks took 23, 24, 44, and a minute. 20, well, even over here, look, 42 seconds, 50 seconds, 48 seconds, 23 seconds, 24 seconds, 44 seconds, one minute, one minute, and then it starts its move up. It's inside this area where they decided to make the reversal. That's where that 18 million came in. 261, that's a big order on the tick size. Because look at the average order. Look at it. 35, 6, 10, 3, 27. Then all of a sudden, a big bid comes in. 261. Well, hold on a second. 273, there or thereabouts. Hmm. Look at where that bid came in. Then they started to offer out. That effectively then led to this sweep lower, 368. They want to start selling, and then up it goes. And then it gets aggressive. And then it doesn't bloody stop. And then it just keeps on going. And then it doesn't stop. And then it makes the high. Okay? That right there, without your bull flags without nothing else, just focusing on the relationship of the bid and the asks, you're effectively catching the point of reversal when you think about it. Because you would have seen inside of this zone here that price was away from the VWAP. So you logically be saying to yourself that you're expecting price to go back to that. At the time of it going back into that VWAP, you see that there are imbalances. These are vector candles. So you're logically going back into these points. And if you were looking at price down here and you notice based on the logic of the time of the tick chart, 
that it's increased, it's, 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 it's being created very quickly. You know, market makers, there ain't no one transacting at the speed of 6,700 ticks from a retail's perspective. It's the algorithms, your market makers, whatever you want to call them. They're the only ones that can transact at speed. They're the ones that have the high frequency trades going off to allow that to happen. That's information. You see that in the future, you then say, hmm, let's just take the idea of that. We've got imbalances in the chart because these little imbalances here were already present when price was all the way down here. Remember that. The deviation away from the VWAP is something you can trade back into. You can look at the logic of bids and offers and say how aggressive were the offers, how aggressive were the bids at specific points. Then all you can do is take a bloody trade. That's all you can do. You can take, for example, you can have 100 confluences, okay? And you are the type of trader that will say, I'm only going to take a trade if 100 confluences come into play. You get your 100 confluences, guess what? The trade flops. You now start challenging your confluences. You come to the charts again with the same logic and you say to yourself, you know what? I need my 100 confluences but I don't want to get burnt like I did last time. So then you wait. You see three of your confluences come in. Then something inside of you says, you know what, I'm starting to get a feel for what's going on now. I'm just going to take the trade just using three confluences. It becomes the best trade of your life. That's the thing, ladies and gentlemen. Even though I'm giving you the idea of what you could be doing with what I'm saying to you, ladies and gentlemen, you can take your patterns, you can take anything you want, all right? Your, your, your penance, your tank, your triangles, your Fibonacci, take whatever you want. But they are based on a visual representation of something happening that has happened in the past. We use the W's and we use the M's. We use the tattoo pattern. Yes, because we know that we're going to see that again. But you add more weight because they don't always play out. But you add more weight to your analysis when you understand the organic way they develop price. Okay? That's going to make life easier for you. Sorry. That's going to make life easier for you when you see Bitcoin at specific points in the chart. Where's the 66K? Oh, wow. What is that, ladies and gentlemen? All of what I've just told you is summarized in two words on the hybrid system. Stopping volume candle. All of what I've just said. The hybrid system encapsulates the logic of the bids and the offers. Okay? The aggressive nature of market maker going long. He's buying. These are all bids. They're going to want to realize a return later on. This is why we say that the vector candles will get recovered. We're talking local, close by. When you see price drop, consolidates, Green vectors start coming into play, shift out, they recover, they come back down again, stopping volume candle. Looking at this, ladies and gentlemen, you know that the stopping volume candle does give you an idea that there is aggressive behavior in that zone. Without the coin ank, without even understanding what exocharts has suggested, would we know that there was 18 million being transacted there? You wouldn't, would you? But the stopping volume candle suggests to you that sort of activity. So whenever you see a candlestick like this, you know there's some activity happening. Look at this up here. See that red vector candle right there on Thursday, the 4th of April? Go back into the coin ank. And what price was that? That was at 69322 all right? And that would put us up here. So that was beforehand, wait. Okay, so it's before that candlestick. All right. So what's up here? So it says that there was some offers here. So 4.37 million were offered out. On top of that, 3.3 million was offered. We had a few more and there was that big order, 356 right there. Just see it. There they go. I don't know if you can see it. Very, very small. But it says 356. That's an offer. All right? 
So now we look at that candlestick and say to ourselves, that's how aggressive they got, that stopping volume candle. The stopping volume candle, their offers were stopping price from going any further. They weren't allowing it to go because the liquidity wasn't there. All the bids, okay, have soaked up and they've bought into all these guys. People have been buying up, okay? The bids were all down below, preparing their positions, getting ready to get filled for when price comes down. Offers have been taken because that's when you see the bids lifting the ask. They're lifting it up and then price comes back down so they can get a better average entry. Rise, retrace, continuation out. That's what validates a rise, a retrace. Not because it's a Fibonacci, not because it's a, a supply and resistance line. Okay, it's nothing to do with that. It's all down to who is buying and who is selling and how much of it are they actually doing it. That's all it is. We complicate trading because we get emotional about the size that we use. We go on social media, we see people that will be like making tens of thousands of dollars in five minutes. It doesn't work like that. They've got the experience. They've sat through the markets. They've sat through the time. They've got the size to do that. But when you're learning the game, just thinking it's going to do a structure up and down, it's not that simple. But you, if you know what to look for, then you're going to find it a little bit easier. The hybrid system shows you that just by looking and understanding the vector candles. You know that when you've got big vectors like this, you know that there's someone engaging in lifting price because they've been buying... Now they're going to want to sell. That's why they always recover the vectors. Okay? Does that make sense, ladies and gentlemen? Does that make sense? <sighs> Look, let's be, let's be honest, ladies and gentlemen. Are you confident when you take a trade? Okay? Are you confident when you take a trade and say... Right, if Bitcoin breaks this trend line, okay, I'm going to go short. And if Bitcoin holds this trend line, I'm going to go long. Are you confident that that's enough information for you? Are you? Now, this is on the hour time frame. Don't get it twisted. Higher time frames, okay? Factor in a little bit more information. You get more of an understanding of the actual behavior, all right? Higher time frame. I'm talking dailies and weeklies because there's a lot of time for the candle to develop. Yeah. But when you're trading shorter time frames, you need to know what's going on inside each of the points of the candlestick. It doesn't make sense to think that a one hour trend line is going to work. And you know what? The sad truth is, is that's what you will see. And when we when you go back and test it, right, you fall into this trap. You draw a trend line like this, and you're going to basically say that when Bitcoin breaks above this trend line, I'm going to go long. Flipping hell. Look at that. It went up. Wow. Awesome. I'm going to do my trend line, baby. I don't need to do anything else. Let me do another one. Here we go. Bitcoin's going down. Okay, it's going down. Fine. Take a long when it breaks the trend line. Let's have a look. Has it broken the trend line? Yep. Okay, cool. I'll take that trade. Up it goes. Man, you know what? This trend line story is absolutely killing it for me. So here's an example. Here's your trend line. Okay, so if Bitcoin breaks above this trend line, you go long. If it doesn't, you go short. Do you really think that the game can really be manipulated like that? Because when you then come to the chart and try and draw your trend lines, it doesn't seem to always work out if the market was so easy to break down. Now, if every if this actually works out, then man, I, I've, I've chewed my own words. Like, <laughs> like but it's, it's what, what's going to be the reason why price will break away from that? You can take the simplicity of trend lines, but add more weight to it. Add caution to caution, per se, Steve Nissen, Japanese candlestick. B. Cham Chandarelli. We don't know. No one knows. No one knows. We don't. 
And anyone says that they do, well, it's debatable, really. I really am going to challenge what they really think, you know? Can we say indefinitely that Bitcoin is going to go to 73,000? Indefinitely. Can we say that? Well, we can't say it indefinitely. I can't guarantee to you 100% to the point where you can go and sell your nan's lung, okay? And go and buy Bitcoin because it's going to go to 73K. But what I can say is that Bitcoin has got more of a chance of going to 73K from here than it does if it was all the way down here at 54. But what time frame are you basing it on? We talking in the next hour, two hours, three days, four days? Look, Bitcoin is very close to its all-time high and it doesn't seem to want to take it. We are closer to the all-time high. Look, Bitcoin was closer to its all-time high right here, 1.36%. Right? Look how close it was. Didn't take it. We are further away from 73. Right? But Bitcoin has a good chance of taking it. How so? It's just the way you look at probabilities. That's all you've got to think about. You have to look at it in terms of probabilities. Those of you who are swing traders that believe that Bitcoin is now going to continue higher from this point, hypothetically. You might be taking the idea that you've got a cyclical play. You've got a little W formation right now. Look, you've got a W formation. Rise up, retrace level one. Rise up, retrace level two. Rise up, retrace level three. Peak formation. Come, come back into that zone and then drop to the downside. That could be the case. If you think that's going to be the case, you then place some orders up here. Place your shorts because you believe that this structure is going to work out. You're going to take your analysis. You're going to say, okay, if I believe that's going to be the case, I'm going to set myself an exit way above the structure, way above or towards the all-time high range. And I'm going to sit tight and wait and see. If it works in your favor and price does actually come all the way back down and test the psychological low, for example, or goes even further down to 66,000, congratulations. You applied a logic. You came to the chart. You, were, you, put, you made sense of it. You took action. You generated feedback. So now when you go into the future, you're going to try and look and replicate the same thing. When you see the success of the trade, you'll ask yourself, so what really made this happen? What was going on? Well, we've got the logic of a cyclical move. So that means they are offering out. Price is rising. Rise up level one. Here we go. There's your level one right there. Rise up level two. There's your level two. Rise up level three. Isn't it funny how each of the levels we are seeing vector candles coming into action? Because there is an intention to mark price. So you can then say to yourself, what have we got? We've got ourselves a seller's market. Okay, so we've got ourselves a seller's market. So if we've got ourselves a seller's market, I'm only going to stick with that seller's market. Okay? When you start to see the offers starting to dry up a little bit, you then say to yourself, hmm, we have been offering out quite some time. I haven't seen the relationship of the bids coming in. Well, let me start looking closer and seeing how the bids develop. And this is where price starts to break down. You start seeing bids coming in. 9.76 million. They're bidding out. Okay. Got bids here. 1 million. Okay, cool. What else have we got? We've got 276,000 there. We've got 10 million right there. Okay. It seems like there's a bit of a relationship here with the bids. A nice sweep lower. $41 million on the bids. At 71,500, they're stacking up. So then we then look to the chart and say to ourselves, okay then, how likely is this relationship going to continue? And then it continues, it goes down, it keeps on going, they keep bidding out, they keep bidding and bidding and bidding until they get to a point when they stop the bidding process. No different to what they did over here. Look, where were the bids? It's very unresponsive, this platform. Where were the bids here? started to dry up and the offers started to come in thinking, you know what, maybe we need to start selling to be fair, bro. Because it looks like the guys are actually stopping the bidding process. The sellers might be trapped. They may be exhausted. The bids just seem to be holding price here. They're not allowing them to go any lower. They're not happy to buy anymore. 
Now we need to start trapping them. There's your short squeeze. Leverage traders get shaken out. The buyers who are coming into play here end up realizing their returns and offer back out again. Because every time they place an order, we assume that they're going to place an offer afterwards. So when you place, it's like a, your, your stop loss, okay? You place your bid down here. You place your offer automatically at the same time up here. That is, in principle, what could be going off inside of these ranges. That's what we're talking about. So now what we've got, what do we have here? From this move to the upside, even though I said to you, what have we got? We've got ourselves an, a seller's market. Correct. This is what it was, the seller's market. What's happening now? Looks like we're starting a buyer's market. The bids are coming in. Now, to really get notification of the bids coming in, we want to see price try and trickle up a little bit more. Really see if the offers really want to sell right now. And if they don't, the bids will come in very aggressively. It's inside these ranges that you're looking for red vector candles, which would be, in principle, the FTD. Price drops down. Does that make sense, ladies and gentlemen? Bitcoin is in distribution. Happy days. Aren't we forming the M on the daily top for now, Bitcoin? Yeah, if we are look forming the M at the top for that, then happy days. You know? That's if that, that if that is the logic, then fine. If that is what you think could be developing, then you go with that. Think about it. Have we seen a violation of the 5 and 13 EMA just yet? No. This candle proves that. But this candle isn't finished. So we really need to see if this candlestick is going to work out or not. Okay? Does that make sense, ladies and gentlemen? Clown's reality, you know. Guy actually came here to say clown's reality. What a clown. <laughs> so, you know, the first, at the end of... At the end, you'll be more confused than before and get liquidated. Tino, does the first vector after the 50 EMA work on the one hour time frame? Also, where do you usually put a stop loss or add to the trade help? The first 50, the first vector candle that appears above the 50 EMA is applicable to any time frame, but you've got to allow the time frame to really show its worth. Usually, when you see it happening on a one hour time frame, unless it's clean closed above the 50 EMA, Usually what happens is they like to recover them sometimes. So you've got to build that into your position. Whenever you do place a trade after the first vector candle above the 50 EMA, whatever time frame it is, you want to place a stop outside of the structure. So an example would be like so. Imagine you took a trade here, the first vector candle above the 50 EMA, which is this one right here, okay? You have to anticipate that they could recover that candle. So you want to put a stop outside of this whole structure. So it'll be down here, just in case they do come down to bounce and move away. Because look, they made the move up, but they also came back down and they also came back up again. If you placed your stop anywhere inside of the range that they made the move from or the manipulation of the green vector, you're gonna get stopped out. They'll always come back into that point. And if they move away from it aggressively, you better take your profits, okay? Um, is a green vector a good thing or not? I don't get it. A green vector candle is a good thing and it's also a bad thing. You might hear me sometimes saying, um, whenever I see a green vector candle on the NASDAQ or the S&P after it's made a move, when it's making a move to the upside, uh, I get a little bit uh, agitated. I don't like it. Because in yesterday's video, we talked about an exercise. We were going back in the charts to identify where the green vector candles are appearing and look at where they appear and what happens after. Green vector candle to the top side, it comes down. Notice how all the green vectors that have appeared inside of this range right here have only led price to come down again. They are adverts to keep people convinced that price is going to continue higher. Look at yesterday's price action. The big green vector candles, we spoke about it yesterday in terms of the example. Price has made the pump up. Green vector candle, okay, logic says, we did it yesterday. Go and watch yesterday's live stream in the morning or the evening. It was the morning. Yeah, I think it was the morning or the evening. Just go watch yesterday's stuff, yesterday's lives, all right? And you'll understand what I'm talking about. 
So, you know, it's just that when you talk about this, you introduce so many variables that it ends up being more confusing than helpful, in my honest opinion. I'm really sorry, bro, but this is the hardest, easiest way to make money. I'm not going to sugarcoat it in any way, shape or form. This is tough. That's why you use experience in the market so you know what you're looking for. I'm telling you what to look for to get yourself familiar with it. Here's an example right now, okay? Take this structure right here. I did this in the weekly review for the Platinum guys, okay? I said to them, you've got to wait for a red vector candle or a green vector candle that is an impressionable candle. What does an impressionable candle look, candle look like? Well, one looks like that. Okay, cool. So let's go find impressionable candles. Okay, so one looks like that. That's an impressionable candle. Fine. Okay, what else is an impressionable candle? Um, we've got one candlestick like this. We've got a candlestick like that. We've got a candlestick like this. Okay, an impressionable candlestick, please, Tino. There's one right there, ladies and gentlemen. There's your impressionable candlestick right there. Okay, cool. Any more impressionable candlesticks? Yeah, there's one right there. Okay, cool. What about another one? Well, there's this one right here. Okay, cool. Another impressionable candlestick, please, Tino. We've got this one right here. Okay, what about this one up here? That's an impressionable candlestick. Yeah, that is true. Okay, okay. Any any other candlesticks, Tino? Um, um, okay, we've got this area here. This is an impressionable candlestick right here. Okay, cool. That's fine. What else we got? Oh, we got another one down here as well, which is this area right there. We've also got another one right here. Okay, so you get the idea of what I've done right now. I've pulled out all the, the boldest moves in the chart. So now what do we do? We now have a strategy towards it. There's one of two things that's going to happen with this. When you have a candlestick that appears like this one, for example, and take this logic, simplify it to this basic entry level. All right. These are green vector candles. Take the midpoints of these candlesticks. And make the assumption, if you are here, right, and you think that price is going to come back into those vectors, there are two points that you could make a point or a target towards, trade towards. One being the midpoint of this vector candle, and the other being the midpoint of this vector candle, okay? In both instances, you can see that they react from each candle midpoint. Look at this candlestick here. See that? It was reactive. It came back up, but then the next candlestick broke it down. So even if you were in a short from the top side of the move, where price broke the 5 and 13 EMA, even though price has expanded away from the moving average, you've already had a big move up and you understand how they operate in the marketplace. They've just liquidated the shorts. They've encouraged the longs to come into play. The offers have stepped in. Price has deviated away from the VWAP. You've got imbalance in the chart. Logic says that you would only associate the idea of price coming back down into these two points. Will it go back down every single time? Well, that's where you go back in the charts and do this exercise. Find the midpoint of the vector candle after you see a move up. Do exactly the same thing on the red vector candle and study how it averagely does it. Then the next time you see it unfold, then you will have a structure that you can utilize and a thought process behind this. The vector candles tries to eliminate the variables that come into play. I could say that this was a Fibonacci X, Y, and Z, the midpoint of the moving average. It could be a stochastic. It could be a MACD. It could be an RSI. It could be an Ichimoku. It could be an Elliott Wave. It could be a Wyckoff. It could be a, um, um, a CCI index. It could be the oh, whatever. It can be anything you want. There will always be variables because there are so many unknown variables in the marketplace. It ain't going to be easy, bro. If it was easy, we would all be killing it. Every single one of us. No one would ever have a problem asking the question. And that same play that I just spoke to you about happened here. So you can't tell me they don't repeat the same shit. Be sure to like and subscribe, ladies and gentlemen, and I'll be checking in with you all later on. Peace.